Disclaimer. This book may contain content that is considered historically inaccurate or culturally insensitive by modern standards. My hope is that by exploring old literature, we will better understand why people of the past thought the way that they did and understand the influences that shaped their culture. This video is not intended for young audiences. Hi, I'm Morgan, and today I'm excited to read you from Out of Door Book, which is the seventh book in a series or a collection of books called The Children's Hour, which was published by Houghton Mifflin Co. in 1907. When Clara Morris first met Garfield, by Clara Morris, Uncle Harry, as the younger Mr. Freeman was generally called, one day loaned me a book. I was delighted beyond words, and even when I went outdoors, for a week I carried the book with me. The sap was running in the maple trees, snow covered but thinly the ground, and patched the great gray boulders. The joy of the sugar camp was at hand. I had molded maple sugar in teacups, and little patty pans, and eggshells, and everything I could think of. I had, one bright morning, two fingers bandaged on one hand, and a thumb on the other because of sugar burns, while a bright new patch of my old frock told of yet another burn, and the wrath of my mother having been turned against me on account of these accumulated mishaps, I had been forbidden the pleasure of the camp. Therefore, I had taken my book and a large cake of maple sugar, and calling upon Judy the Elastic and Roy the Stiff to follow, I had gone forth to kill time as best I could. After a wild race that ended with the, with the hound far ahead, me in second place, and Roy well behind the field, I conversed with them on various topics, they nearly wearing their tails out in excited approval of my ideas. Then, noticing the extreme whiteness of Judy's teeth, which she almost wholly exposed in her doggish smile, I remarked, "'You should have been called Sweet Lips instead of Judy. "'And Roy, if you had not been too old, I bet you a penny. "'Uncle Harry would have called you Garfield, "'for that's the name of the man he's always talking about "'whenever anybody comes here. "'It's just Garfield, Canal and Garfield, Man and Garfield, Speech and Garfield. "'Oh, you beast!' For Roy had thrust his nose into my apron pocket and grabbed the cake of sugar, but his stiff old legs gave out quickly. I rescued the sugar, and with the calm indifference of childhood's childhood, wiped it off with my apron and returned it to my pocket. But when Judy began to nose it violently, I felt that the discretion was the better part of valor, and looking about vainly for another place of safety, I held my book under my chin while I climbed up to the top of a high rail fence. There I turned laboriously, tucked my red calico dress under me to, mi to mitigate the severity of that top rail, and seated myself, straightened my hood, opened my book, and with a dog on hind legs on each side of me, I fairly they shared the sugar with them while fighting while between bites i read a harrowing story of slavery i had been there some time for the cake of sugar had become a mere crumbly bit so hard to divide into three portions that i yielded to the urgent pleading of a pair of dim brown eyes on one side of me and a pair of brilliant topaz ones on the other and broke the fragment in two pieces and as they were crunched to powder by sharp white teeth from up the rough and ruddy road there came the loudly cried gee gee ha that announced the approach of an ox team. Instantly, six interested eyes, blue, brown, and yellow, turned in that direction, for under some circumstances, even a passing load of wood is worthy of attention. Presently, there turned into the road from a cross lane a pair of red and white oxen, swaying patiently beneath their heavy yoke, whose guide, tall and broad, did a great deal of shouting, but almost no goading, for which I liked the man whose face I had not yet seen. Both dogs left me at once and hastened to inquire into the into the treatment and general condition of the steers, and to look under the wagon to see if there might be a dog there, as country etiquette required, and finding an ancient brind brindled watchdog, there followed a great waving of tails and a general exchange of salutations, and Judy being a scatterbrained, flighty young thing at best, spatted her hands with lightning quickness before him and invited the newcomer to race her, but he only pressed closer to the uh, to the off steer, looking him over anxiously and pretending not to have heard her embarrassing invitation. The young are so thoughtless at times. Later on, he and Roy, who was his contemporary, found a dry and sunny spot where they sat down and talked to the wonderful tenacity of rheumatism. Sorry, and talked of the wonderful tenacity of rheumatism when it settled in a dog's shoulder. Meantime, the man, approaching, called loudly, Hello, hello! 
toward the house. No answer coming. He halted his ears and stood still, looking doubtfully over toward the barn. He wasn't dressed the typical... He was in dress, the typical countryman, big and broad shoulders, his trap and broad shouldered, his trousers legs tucked into his boot boot tops, his thick coat fastened close about his middle, with a leather strap never meant for a belt, an enormous pair of grayish blue mittens on his hands, a comforter of amazing length and fighting mad colors wound about his throat, and a cap with ear tabs on his head, a cap whose dark brown color accentuated the yellow the yellowish blondness of his hair, all that was countryman, but in the big, ruddy, full moon face, with the wide, eager blue eyes, the bold, well formed nose, the kindly, smiling lips, all seeming to radiate vitality and energy. There was no country stolidity, far from it. As his wandering eye returned from the barn, the dogs, clambering back to me again, drew his attention to where, like a red woodpecker, I perched on the fence. Oh, he exclaimed, say, little girl, is Freeman at home? I looked at him and gravely asked, which one, Jebediah or Uncle Harry? The ready face quavered for a moment. Then the answer came, Uncle Harry. I shook my head regretfully. He's away. I wish he wasn't. Then I continued, Mr. Jebediah Freeman's home, with his eye. I wish he wasn't. What a shout of laughter came from the stranger's great throat. The wind fluttered over the leaves of my story just then, and the laugh ended abruptly. The big blue eye sparkled. I, is that a book? he asked. Are you reading it? Of course I am, I replied with offended dignity. Oh, he exclaimed. What is it about, eh? Is it good? Well, I replied with a critical twist of my hooded head. No, it's not so very good. Then hurriedly, of course, all books are some good. This is called Dread, or The Dismal Swamp, and it's kind of shuddery, you know? But it's not like my bet but it's not like my two best books. He came quite close to me, and asked in the most interested manner, Which are they, your two best books, sissy? And I answered swiftly, Jane Eyre and Robinson Crusoe. He lifted up his voice again in hearty laughter, while he smote the rail a blow with his fist, then said Judy frantic with excitement, and then he cried, Ha! Huh? Good! Good for you, little girl! I back your judgment in books! But who are you, anyway? You can't be a country child! He looked toward the house, and then suddenly answered his own question. Why, I guess you must be the daughter of old Jebediah's housekeeper. That's who you are. Well... I returned rather testily. I can guess, too, and I guess you are my Uncle Harry's Mr. Garfield. That is, if you ever make speeches. He caught my face between his two, between his big mittened hands and laughed as he rocked me so from side to side. I tell you what, little one, if I had a faster team here, I think I'd run you off. Where to? I asked. Oh, he answered, to some place chock full of books. Would you go? And being a miniature woman, I shook my head violently while smiling a distinct consent. He glanced up at the farmer's clock. The sun caught up, caught up his goad and started up his oxen. The brindle broke off his conversation with Roy to make a swift investigation of the soles of my shoes and the condition of our barnyard gate before hastening to take his proper position under his wagon. Then I demurely remarked, You didn't want me to tell Uncle Harry anything then, did you? Good Lord, cried the driver. I clean forgot. Please tell Freeman not to fail Garfield at the meeting tomorrow night at Aurora. Remember, little girl, Aurora. Not at the schoolhouse. That's too small. Aurora. Goodbye. And with much creaking and rumbling, the wagon moved in response to the f to the f and with much creaking and rumbling, the wagon moved in response to the efforts of the red and white steers, who swayed and shambled and geed and hawed in patient obedience to the big, kind voice that directed them. Once he turned and looked back. Once he turned and, looking back, saw me standing on the fence ready to jump, while the dogs wildly leaping up in front of me made them jump impossible. And so, with the last homeric burst of laughter, the young Garfield of the farmer period passed out of my life and entered again years later through the doors of a Washington drawing room. And that is the end of When Clara Morris First Met Garfield by Clara Morris. I hope that you enjoy this story and that you're having a great day. Bye!